silliness, all of our personal preference, all of our uh, things that hinder us from pursuing you, Lord, that we would pursue you anew, that your word would help us to do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're continuing, like I said, in Mark chapter 10. We have a great deal to cover to get all the way through today. We're going to start in verse 17, if you want to go and find that as well. But as kind of an introduction to where we're going to be at today, there's kind of two basic categories of questions that we see in Scripture that are brought to Jesus. The, the first one is usually a category of, of, of not really wanting an answer to a question, but kind of to test Christ or make Him stumble or, or stump Him. Most often we see the Pharisees bringing those types of questions to Christ. Uh, we have the Sadducees bringing those types of questions, not really wanting an actual answer, but in an effort to, to stump Him or, or make Him seem as if He doesn't know what He's doing. But that second category of inquisitor that we have is someone who genuinely wants to to know what Christ has to say. We, we see that as well all throughout the, the scriptures, especially in Mark and the gospel we've been walking through. Uh, these, these questions of Christ are, are usually done to, to bring about the, the section of teaching that Mark has put through the inspiration of the Spirit in that spot in the text. And, and today we're going to have another instance of a question being asked of Jesus. So go to Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to set the stage here. We're still in the, the region of Perea. We're, we're getting close to his entry into Jerusalem. In Mark 17, it says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up to him, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I think we, we tend to do something with this story when, when we approach it, because most of us have heard, if you've spent any time in the church, you've, you've heard about the story of the rich young ruler. And one of the ways that we often approach this, this individual himself incorrectly, I think, is sometimes we assume, because of how the story ends up, we assume that he's not really wanting an answer from Jesus, that he's disingenuous when he asks this question, right? But, but I think that's incorrect. I don't think Mark is intending to, to give us that picture of this man. The, the posture that he takes towards Jesus is someone who understands in some sense who Jesus is. He, he's approaching him. He, he kneels before him. He, he says, good teacher, good rabbi. He, he gives him a, a title and a position that's, that's higher. And, and this man does have some sort of position. He, he's described as the rich young ruler, the rich young man, whatever way that, that's describing him here. But he kneels before Jesus. He acknowledges that Jesus has wisdom. He, he's genuinely seeking an answer for, for this question that he has. He, he has a concern about wanting to know what Jesus is going to say about this. And so we'll see it here as well. That there's a couple of things about this man's character that are revealed just in this opening couple of verses in the way he's asking this question. I think the first thing that, that we can see is, is this man is trying to be a faithful Jew. He, he longs to know what it is that's required of him. He wants to follow what, what's been set out. He wants to follow Yahweh and, and keep his commands. He, he's longing for this, and he sees Jesus as someone who can help him do this. And so he approaches him in an extremely humble position, he could have, with a position that he may have held, he could have sent someone else to ask Jesus. He wouldn't have had to bother to go out and do so. In fact, we see other people sending people to ask Jesus to help them. But this man approaches him personally. He gets on his knee and he says, I want to know what it is to be faithful to my forefathers, to those who've gone before me who have been faithful to Yahweh. I want to know, too, what it is to inherit this eternal life, this hope that we have in him. But, but also, secondly, there, there's something we can learn about this man through the question itself that he's asking. And it'll be revealed as we go along this statement that I'm about to make, because th this question can be asked without this attitude behind it. But from the information we gather through the rest of this story, I think we can see this when we read it, because he says, what can I do in order to inherit eternal life? And as we go on and we see this man's mindset, we can see the way that he's asking the question here shows that there's a misunderstanding about his entire basis for this question. There's a piece of this question that he doesn't even get as he's asking this question. 
He says, what can I do in order to inherit eternal life? I think we can conclude that this man has been a follower or at least knows a great deal about the predominant theology of this time that the Pharisees were teaching, about a legalistic system in which they obtain for themselves favor before God. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'll see that as we go. But just as much as we should be seeking good answers, I think this is important to, to, to stop and, and think about in this. As important as it is to seek good answers for our questions, as much as we should be seeking answers from the text of Scripture, it's also very important that we learn to ask good questions of Scripture. That when we approach the text, that we prepare ourselves to ask the correct question of what's happening here. And that's not to say that all questions are, are bad questions in, in that regard, but let me give you an example of what I mean. It, it, when you're in math class and the teacher asks you what 3 plus 3 is, that's as high as I can add, what 3 plus 3 is, your answer is usually going to be 7. Just kidding. I wanted you all to freak out for a second. It's 6, okay? 3 plus 3. Now, now, now if you then ask the teacher, well, what is 3's favorite color? That's not a question that they can answer. That's not a good question, right? Y'all have heard my stance on there are dumb questions. Okay, this is why they don't have me teaching full-time anywhere because uh, I'm too mean to the kids. But th there, are, there are questions that aren't good. There are questions that, 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 that are false in their assumptions when they're being asked that, that, that the Scriptures cannot answer for us because the question isn't correct. And so we need to, to not just seek answers, but seek the correct way to approach the Scriptures with our questions. And, and this is an example, as Jesus answers this man, that you'll see he, he's approaching with an incorrect assumption about the type of answer he's seeking. He, he doesn't have correctly in his mind what it is that he's really seeking because his question off the bat is not correct. And there's really, just as there are two types of inquisitors who approach Christ, there's two ways that we can approach the text with our questions. We don't have Jesus walking with us today. We do have His authoritative Word that that's author, has authority over my life, my practice, everything. It comes down to here. I can approach the question as the Pharisees approach Jesus in, in a way to, to answer it that, that seeks to satisfy what I want the text to say. And we could probably all think of examples where this has happened before, where people will try to self-justify things and, and use the Scriptures in a way to do so. Clearest example, when Jesus is tested in the wilderness, uh, Satan uses Scripture to tempt him. He, he takes the Word of God that Jesus himself is there when it was written. He, he writes it. He, he, he's part of that trinity that inspires the, the Scriptures. And he tries to push it against him using the Bible. We, we can try to approach the text in a way to, to justify my personal position, or we can come to the, the text and learn how to ask good and better questions by seeking what is the answer from the Word of God. I want to put aside what I want the answer to be, or, or even my correct, incorrect, rather, understandings of what the answer should be, and approach the text in such a way that says, this is the authority that gives me an answer, that, that provides for me what it, not even what the answer is, but a better way for me to understand the question that I'm asking. And the only way that we get to the point where we ask good and better questions is when we're using the text to form good and better questions. When we use the Bible to help us to, to form a mindset that's submissive to the Word itself. And that says that I, I, as a sinful human being, may not be approaching the Scriptures in the way that I even should be. That I need to yield to the way that Scriptures teach me with the way that they're written, with the things that they say to help me ask better questions. We, we see this uh, especially in the letters of Paul. If you're reading through his argument he makes in Romans as he's talking about the way that we're justified before God, you'll see multiple questions that he asks of the reader. Uh, should we continue sinning that grace may abound? Well, of course not. He, he's wanting to engage his audience with those questions. And this is another thing, too, that, that we've kind of lost in the way that we, we learn in, in this time in the Second Temple period. Most of teaching happened with questions being asked of the teacher, and then the teacher turned around and asking a question back. I don't know if you've ever been in the situation where it's question upon question battle, especially if you've got a toddler, you've been there. But, but he, he's trying to get the person asking the question to think about the question they're asking. If we ask the right questions, if we ask correct and good questions, we're going to find a better answer for it. 
For, for example, if I am, am approaching the text and trying to figure out, well, why is sin so bad? Why is it a big deal to God when I sin, but I don't understand what holiness is? I don't understand the, the fall of Genesis 3. I don't understand any of these things. I'm going to have to do some work to get to the point to ask a better question, not just why is sin bad, but why does God not absolutely annihilate me when I sin? To get, get a full-orbed view when I ask those questions. So I know I love it. When I get asked questions, I, I love thinking about uh, good biblical questions. If, if you call me, I had this happen just this last week. If you call me with a question, if you call me, first of all, unless I'm giving CPR or something, I'm going to answer, okay? Or unless it's after 10 p.m., okay? Uh, I, I will answer. I love questions. When, when people ask me questions, it means they're thinking about the Word of God. It, I love it. Please bother me. Call me. Ask me questions. We, I'll ask you questions back, and we'll get confused together. It'll be great. Okay, but asking better questions of the text, that, that, that's a good thing to learn from, from this here. But Jesus' reply to this man, if we don't understand the nature of learning from questions, may seem odd because Jesus doesn't directly answer him at first. He asks him a question because he's going to try to correct this man's misunderstanding that's going to be more, more visible as we read through the text and see the way that this man acknowledges this question. Jesus is trying to get him to see his own flaw in the way he's asking this question. In the same way that, for our example, with Paul in, in Romans, he asks questions in order to see our flaws when we're approaching the text. Because this man calls Jesus good rabbi. And this is what Jesus questions him about. Not the, the question that he wants answered, but he questions about the way he even addresses him. He says, even in your address, there's something that if you fixed, you would you would understand better the question you're even asking. Who's got the count for how many times I said question this morning? You do? Okay. No one raised their hand. I was just pointing. But he's identifying that problem. He doesn't give him time to answer. Or maybe he, he, there was this long, awkward pause and the man refused to answer. I like to think it's the long, awkward pause because I love those things too. They're just kind of sitting there. The man doesn't answer Jesus' question. He says, why do you call me good? You approach me and you say, good rabbi, but only God is good, so why do you call me good? Almost an anticipation of, do you understand? It just, just in the same way that Peter had a confession that you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, do you perhaps understand what you're saying when you call me good? You're approaching me as good, but there's no answer that this man gives. So Jesus goes next, verse 19, to answer that question. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, <coughs> excuse me, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go and sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The first thing I want us to notice about Jesus' response is his disposition towards this man. This man is woefully misformed about even his question isn't, isn't a correctly formed question. He doesn't even understand the goodness of who Jesus is. But, but does Jesus lose his temper with him? Does, does he give him a dressing down? This fool has the gall to tell the God in flesh that he has kept the law perfectly. He deserves a harsh rebuke, doesn't he? But the text tells us that Jesus loved him. Jesus saw that this man was lost. This man wasn't even asking the right question for the answer he was looking for. And so Jesus corrects this man, and he, because he loves him, he tells him the truth. Because he loves him, he's truthful with him. He's honest with him, well knowing that this man would not like the answer that he gave him. He gave him the truth. And, and, and along with the, the side lesson of, of asking good questions, I think there's a lot to be said about the way that Jesus responds to this man. First and foremost, with the basis of he loved this man. This man just absolutely did not understand the purpose of the law or, or his own sinfulness or his ability to keep the law rightly. But Jesus loved this man and he gives him the truth. We live in an extremely sinful, lost world 
that for some reason still yet, we still somehow know up from down. We've forgotten almost every other thing of, of basic laws of nature and all of these crazy and wild things. This world does not know how to have eternal life. This world does not know how to honor God. The, the only way we know the, 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 the path of eternal life, the only way we know who God is, the only way we can know how to honor God is what's revealed to us by God himself as he reveals himself in the scriptures. The, the, the world by far, far and large, that's not the way you say it, that's okay, is lost. Not are they lost, that they're ignorant of their own lostness. The world thinks it's just fine. Most of the world thinks that at least they are just fine. Everyone else is nuts, but I've got it right. I know what I'm doing. And so when the world approaches us as believers and, and, and looks for affirmation of, of themselves or affirmation of their sin or, 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 or is hoping for us to give them approval like by, by, by giving them approval by God through us, if we're not sharing the truth with the world, we do not love them. The, the, the world standard of, of love is so upside down, backwards, sideways, that love is when you tell me that there's nothing wrong with me, that, I, that I'm perfectly fine just the way that I am, that there's no issue, no flaw, that I'm a special flower, all of these wonderful things. Affirm me, that's what love is. But when we see Jesus, when he loves this man, he doesn't say, oh, you've kept it since your youth. Well, then you're good. He tells them the truth. He tells them, no. You, you think you know the way of salvation, but you don't. You, you think you've kept it since your youth and you're, you're in good standing with God, but you're not. He loves him and he tells him. He doesn't give him a, a warm, fuzzy feeling. And he doesn't save face or any of these things like that. If we do not tell the world the truth, we don't love them. We may love the world according to their own standards, but, but we really shouldn't care about cultural standards that shift and change every 10 years. We should care about what God says it means to love our neighbor. And Jesus displays that here by loving him and telling him the truth, knowing he will not like the answer. But he's honest with him. He tells him because he loves him. If we people who, who know the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the, the most hateful thing that we could possibly do, if we understand the gospel, the worst, most vile thing that we can do is not share it. Is to not tell the truth to a world that's dying in darkness. That's the ultimate not loving your neighbor, is not telling your neighbor the truth of Christ. Let's make sure we're, we're emulating Jesus here as we do that. And one of the most unfortunate parts about this is the world is so deeply deceived in this that it has seemed to creep its way into the church where we've ignored sin. We've ignored its consequences. We, we've become affirming of sin. But that is not love and that is not a church. Love is most fully displayed in the person of Jesus Christ being brutally murdered for my sin while I am still a sinner. That Christ would condescend to a sinful world and substitute himself for me and take the penalty and the wrath of my sin. This world doesn't know what love is. This world doesn't know anything. We have to tell the world the truth. And notice in, in this man's response in verse 22 that he is disheartened. He is full of sorrow. He, he's genuinely asking a question. This is why we, we've got so many descriptors of how he feels after this question is, is asked. He thinks he's doing okay, but he wants to like confirm with Jesus, I've kept these things from the youth, so I want to ask you this question. I genuinely want to know, am I in the right standing with God? And when Jesus kind of is like, no, you're not, you, you don't get it at all. He's full of sorrow. He's upset. The truth is told to him, but he does not like the answer that's given to him because he loves his possessions more than even his inquisitive nature wants to honor God. This is kind of the whole issue here. We're using the example of a rich young ruler, but the big broad view here is this man's idolatry over God. That he loves something greater. He, he may seem like, I, I want to know. I'm approaching this man. I'm bowing before him. I'm giving a genuine question. I want to know these things. And when he gets the answer, because he loves something greater, even though he does have, have a genuine question, he wants to know. He wants to, to be good and, and follow Yahweh rightly. But he has an idol that's more important to him. 
the, the genuine nature and, and genuineness and curiosity is not a mark of a believer if that's where it stops. What, what marks a believer is a faithful obedience from a transformed heart. This man is genuine, but he's not a follower. He, he wants to know, he wants to see, but when he, he sees, he's disgusted. He's sorrowful. He can't do that. He can't compel himself to give up his idol. His idol's a greater love. But notice what, the way that Jesus answers him is, is brilliant because he, he uses the law to, to answer him, but he does it backwards. He, he uses the, the second table of the law of the Ten Commandments. He, he, he flips it on its head and he says, have you, have you lied? And you, you know the, the law. And he gives him the law. The man says, yeah, of course, I've, I've, I've kept the law. But what Jesus does is he starts with the easy part of the law. Because you can lie, or not lie, rather. You can not lie and know God. You can not lie and be a faithful spouse. You can not lie and, and, and you know, not steal and, and not be a Christian, not be a follower of God. He gives them that first, and this man still not really seeing what, what Christ is trying to tell him. says, well, I've kept all of these things. I've been good. No one has found out my lie. No one has found out that I've stolen or, or that I've wronged or I've done all of these things. This man must have completely missed. He was sick that day when, when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount where he says it's not just that you cannot kill. It's that if there's hate in your heart, you have killed. It's not just that you should not commit adultery, but if you lust in your heart for someone, you have committed adultery. It's far beyond just the superficial keepings of the law that's supposed to point us to our sinfulness and point us to God's holiness and show us what it looks like to love God from a heart that loves God. But he says, I've kept all of these things. And then Jesus smacks him with the top half of the law. And he identifies his idol and he says, okay, well then go sell everything that you have. This man is even known to us by his idol. He's the rich young ruler. Go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor. And then, and then come follow me. But that was too much because his idol was too much. He was willing to, to keep the law to what he thought was the keeping of the law as long as it did not deal directly with the fact of his heart that he was not loving God. He was keeping the law for the sake of keeping the law. But he had an idol that he was not willing to give up. Jesus' answer is, is basically this. You may think that you are a good person, but unless you've surrendered all that you are to God, you are not His. This is part of that deception of that, that sinfulness of heart that you're, you'll be hard-pressed to find someone who doesn't call themselves a good person. No, no one realizes they're the villain, okay? We all are, but no one will realize that. No one really truly understands that. Well, I'm a good person. But Jesus Himself answers that. He says, no one's good but God. Yet this man still thinks he's kept the law. If we don't give all of we are, if we don't surrender to God, we are not His. It doesn't matter what standard of goodness we think that we maintain, it is not good. It may be good by the world's standard, but not good by God's standard. Do not miss this. It was, it was not that Jesus gave this man a legalistic path to the kingdom. I've heard people try to use this in this way. What that is is completely misunderstanding the way to read the Bible. He was not saying, well, if you're rich, you've got to sell everything you have, then you get to go to heaven. He was pointing to this man's idol, this, man, this thing that this man loved more than anything else, and said, that idol's got to go. You say you've kept the second half of the law. You haven't, but that's not even the, the big thing in, in view here. It's this idol that you love that's more important. But this man says that's, that's, not, that's not worth giving up. This guy could have given everything he had to the poor. He became destitute, and he still would have been lost. It's not the, the, the giving away of those things. It's the fact that because it was his idol, he was not going to give it away. Because that was his God, he was not going to forsake it. We could so easily apply the rich young ruler to anything else. Because this isn't a, a story about rich people. This is a story about idolatry. About loving anything more than you love God. The pivotal action in this text is not give up your possessions. It's the come follow me part. It's the after you've laid down your idol, given it up, completely removed it from yourself, then come follow me. Our, our actions and our service can still be done and be lost in sin. 
We, we do from a transformed heart. We, we do perform those things that are keeping with His law. We do good works prepared beforehand for us, Scripture says. But the come follow me is the catch. Even people who do good things in the name of Jesus will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21, makes that very clear. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And we may read that text and, and, and be confused by it because he says, the one who does the will of my Father and then the things that they're doing, casting out demons, prophesying, mighty works, isn't that the will of the Father? Aren't those, aren't those things that Christians are supposed to do? Well, first and foremost, a Christian is one who submits to the Father, whose heart has been surrendered to the Father. It is not these actions that, that bring them salvation. It's Christ alone who brings salvation. These things will, will flow out of that heart, but the obedience of the will of the Father is to that last part, I never knew you, is to know the Father. And more importantly, that Jesus would know you. Have I surrendered to Christ in such a way that I know Him? Or have I surrendered some time to do the good things, but don't know Him? When, when Paul talks about you know, us being pitied above all people if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, because it, it's a hill of beans if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, this, this is the exact type of people that are to be pitied. Those that think they know Christ, but they've fooled themselves, they don't. So they do the trappings. They try to keep the law that I've kept these things from my youth. I've done all of these things. But because of the idol that reigns in their hearts, they will not fully surrender to God, and they don't actually know Him. They're self-deceived. Even our law-keeping is lawlessness if we don't know God. Because no one can actually keep the law. And Jesus makes it very clear in that next passage the, the, the impossibility of all this. Verse 23. <coughs> oh, goodness. <coughs> I'm not pausing for dramatic effect. I'm sorry. Verse 23. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. Exceedingly astonished. That doesn't happen a whole lot. They're amazed at this. Even on the mountain when, when Jesus is transfixed and, and there's Moses and Elijah, Peter isn't exceedingly astonished. He's a, a dingbat saying, let me build you some tents, right? They're blown away by what he has just said. Because in this time period, and unfortunately it has carried over into this time period, the mindset was and continues to be, well, if you have wealth, it's because God likes you and you're blessed of God. So what Jesus is saying to them is those people that you think are blessed of God because they're rich, it, it's difficult for them to get into heaven. And they're blown away by that. But we thought you, you blessed them monetarily because they were keeping with what you'd said to do. No. If we don't realize this yet, even the wicked can be wealthy. That's not God's blessing in a most explicit sense. That there's not some, some you know, God is not a capitalist who, who gives you money because you're doing the right things and he likes you. Even Jesus says here, he, he uses that category of people and they're exceedingly astonished and they said to him, who can be saved? If these people that, that, that we think that you really like can't even, can't even make it into the kingdom, a camel through the eye of a needle, who can be saved? What hope is there for man? And Jesus is thinking, you're starting to get it, guys. He looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not for God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus takes the absolute sledgehammer to any idea that I get into heaven. That I do anything to earn God's favor. God is not letting me in because I'm so cool and handsome. Because of the wonderful things that I do. Because even my law keeping is lawlessness before a holy God. 
It is not just that I sin against him. I am a sinner. I am by nature a child of wrath. There is no hope for me. A camel through the eye of a needle. That's the hope I have of getting into the kingdom. But God makes it possible. There's numerous explanations for the camel through an eye of a needle, different theories of, of what exactly that means, but, but don't get lost in the trees. Jesus is trying to say it is impossible. There's nothing that you can do, no favor you can earn, no amount of law keeping that you think you have. In a similar way, that when he says this, it's similar to when the prophet Nathan confronts King David and he tells him the story of this man who stole the sheep from the person who had one sheep and David's getting all worked up. Man, we've got to kill that guy. And Nathan says, that you're the guy. Jesus is saying, you are the rich man. If you think in any way your human ability and law-keeping gets you to the kingdom, you're the rich young fool. Because it can't. It is impossible. But then he gives us kind of a summary of the two greatest words we see next to each other in all of the scriptures, but God. It is impossible for man to please God, but God chooses to act in order for us to have a righteousness that satisfies God. There's, there's no room for me to be prideful over my own accomplishment, my own ability, my own giving, my anything. It is grace, 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 100% grace that God has saved me. Romans 5, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, while I was still in my rebellion, while I was still warring against God, while I was still the fool thinking I was keeping the law when I actually wasn't because my heart was rotten, Christ dies for us. He shows His love for us in that way when we're still sinners. He dies for us. Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy because of His great love which He loved us even while we were dead in our trespasses. I don't know how much time you spend around dead people. They don't do a lot. And He says that's what you are spiritually before a holy God. You're a rotten, bloated corpse. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. But God, being rich in mercy, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. When we read these passages, do we not see the exceeding ocean to tsunami of grace that's overcoming us? made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. We deserve eternal death. We deserve the full, unbridled wrath of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for anyone in this room to enter the kingdom of heaven. But we have a God who is so rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love that He calls us to Himself. That He gives us grace that we are undeserving of. He gives us mercy instead of His wrath. And it is by His grace that I'm saved. There's no room for the pride of I've kept the law. There's no room for anything in, in place of, of Christ in our life. No idol can hold any prominent position when we understand the grace that has saved us. Nothing is deserving of my attention and time and effort outside of God and His will if I understand from which He's brought me up. We sin against an infinitely holy God. We seek our will above His. We seek our glory above His, our kingdom above His. But God, who is rich in grace, with mercy that knows no bounds, pours out a truly unconditional love. A real unconditional love. Not a fake worldly love that makes me feel good about the things that I want to do, but a love that condemns me and tells me of that sin that tells me that I, I have, I'm an abomination before a holy God, that I must repent. And He shows me that love in Christ on the cross. 
It is grace, 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 a thousand times grace that has saved me. Unless we surrender to the supremely gracious and merciful God, it is impossible for a man to enter the kingdom. We conclude this text in in verse 28. Peter, shocker, Peter's the one talking. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. If we do not have a heart that is completely humbled, flat on our face before God and His will, above our own will, above our own desire, above what I think God would want me to do, but what God actually wants me to do, in the way I should be submitting to Him, we do not have Christ. That's a very harsh thing to say. Well, I don't, keep, I don't, I don't do that perfectly. I don't surrender perfectly to Christ. Well, lucky for you, it's not just his death, but also his perfect life that covers us in that. But, but this is what Christ is driving towards for his disciples to be. That I would be sanctified to this end. That I would be changed to this end. That I would have a repentant heart that is transformed and comes to realize that Christ is everything. And when Christ is everything, I have a heart that is willing to leave mother and father and sister and brother and even lands to pursue him. Anything short of that, anything short of that willingness is because that is indeed my idol. That's the test he gives his disciples here. You see this man with this idol? Let's talk about him. Let's point at him. Let's do all these things. Oh, by the way, if you are not willing to leave these very closely held wonderful things, well, whatever they may be, longer than the list even included here, whatever it is, I'm not willing to give up and leave behind and forsake and throw into the fire for the sake of Christ. That's my idol. That's the thing I'm loving more than God. And what a blessing it is when the Spirit reveals our idol to us. Because he gives us the opportunity to draw nearer to Christ by smashing it to pieces. Do not take the opportunity when your mind is clear to see what your idol is. Do not wish away that opportunity. But take advantage of that opportunity to smash your idols. Whatever that idol is, whether thing or person, position, reputation, pride, possessions, everything is dust. When Christ is my all, nothing amounts to anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, I I am pleading with you. If you are here and you do not know Christ, do not be like the rich young ruler. This is an opportunity for you to be confronted with your idolatry, to be confronted with the fact that you are not good, that you will stand before a holy God and you have no chance. Christ is worth all. His salvation from sin and a peace with God is worth all. Do not walk away sorrowful because you're not willing to smash an idol. Do not sacrifice your sanctification and your pursuit of God because you have some idols left that you're not willing to sacrifice just yet. I have told you the plain truth because I love you. We must forsake our idols. We must submit to the word. We must have Christ as our all in all. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be confronted with the word today. Lord, as we approach the scriptures, help us to ask better questions. Help us to see the the truth that you're trying to reveal to us, that the spirit would be stronger than my own mind. As I read, that you would guide me, that you would help me with the text, Lord. That you would help reveal things like this. Lord, it is not just a story about some rich guy who ended up not wanting to follow Jesus. It is a story about me and my idolatry. It's a story about my impossibility to come to you. It is a story about the abundant grace and mercy that you've lavished upon me. Lord, Lord, for those who who know you, God, I'm begging you, help us to understand that grace. 
Well, let that be the lens through which we, we do everything, that I would humble myself before you, that I would forsake time or possession or whatever it may be that, that is calling as an idol to pull me from you, Lord, that we, we would put all of those things to the side, that we wouldn't be foolish and, and try to take advantage of, of getting a, a get-out-of-hell-free card but not walking with you, that we wouldn't be self-deceived. Lord, if there are those here who are in the stance of the rich young ruler who've been confronted with Christ, who've been confronted that they, they are not good, that they are sinners before a holy God, Lord, press their heart that, to do to, to whatever it takes to cause them to come to repentance, Lord, that they would not pass up this opportunity to come to you. Lord, help us as we go out to share the truth with a world full of lies. Help us to love this world by telling them the truth. No matter what it's going to cost me, no matter what it will what it will, it'll look back on me, but I will stand in your truth alone. Lord, give us the courage to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.